All right. Hello and welcome everyone to Balancing Digital Revenue and User Experiences. Um, as you guys know, before I hop into any of the, like, the details and particulars of what we're going to talk about today, I like to kind of tell a story that I think kind of illustrates the point of today's event. So for you guys that maybe you're just joining me for the first time, um, I'm actually, uh, I'm from rural Missouri, which is in the middle of the United States. It's a very, very small place. So it's a place called Montgomery City, Missouri, and the population is less than 3,200 people. Um, it was even less than that when I was born there. And uh, this building that you see here was the home of uh, a lot of different restaurants, uh, a place called Pit Stop, a place called Ronda's, uh, a pizza place. It had a, it, there was a sushi restaurant here in the middle of rural Missouri, and it was just called Sushi. Uh, it didn't last very long. And ultimately, it was about three different uh, iterations of a steak restaurant as well. At one point, it was something called Steak Barn, where it was not even a barn. As you can see, it's just a blue building. And uh, ultimately, all of these businesses failed pretty quickly because they didn't understand their audience. And their audience, in this case, was a group of people that lived in rural Missouri that really didn't want to go out to eat in the rural Missouri town. They wanted to go out to eat at surrounding towns that were much larger. And so ultimately, what that building, what, what restaurant actually ended up working there was a place called Crumbly Burger. It was a pretty simple place where you could get kind of what I would describe as like a crumbly hamburger. And uh, ultimately it was successful because it paired really well with the audience. Um, the, the experience at that place was exactly what the people expected and that's really what we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about helping you tailor better experiences to your users uh, and really why UX and revenue are inexorably tied. So I'm going to give you some data that you've probably never seen before around how user experience affects revenue and what you can do in light of this and how you can monitor it. Uh, and basically, how can you start to implement some of the, the principles that you're going to learn here today onto your website. Uh, and then uh, I'm going to also share with you some tips on how to use a Zoic uh, our platform to basically help you with a lot of these efforts. Um, so you can see there's the welcome sign to uh, my former hometown, Montgomery City. And basically, if you can make the experiences better for your visitors, they're going to re reward you for your efforts. So um, now we can get into who I am and, uh, and what I'm going to be talking about today. I'm joined today by my friend and colleague, Piper Lafrano. Hi, guys. So Piper is our U.S. team lead for the Azoic Publishing team, and uh, she's worked with thousands of different publishers over the course of the last few years, and uh, she's going to be sharing with you a little bit later today um, uh, more about how you can leverage Azoic in some of these efforts. But I'm going to set the scene a little bit first for you guys that don't know me. My name is Tyler Bishop. I'm an award-winning digital marketer. I'm the head of marketing at Azoic. Uh, I've served as an SEO and marketing expert for startup boards uh, and exponentially increase the traffic on dozens and dozens of sites. And uh, that's part of what we're, we're going to talk about today is basically how we can help you uh, grow your site. So how are UX and revenue connected and how do we even know this, right? So how do we know that user experience and revenue have a correlation? So I think a lot of us inherently understand this. So I think we, a lot of times we talk to publishers and they'll say, the number one concern that I have is making sure that the user experience or uh, my site, I want to worry about my users first, for, first and foremost. And I think we inherently do that because we know that maintaining a good relationship with our users is ultimately beneficial for the long term. But there's some, there's some principles and some math and science inside to that as well that I think we can use to measure and make sure we're really doing that because they think going on our gut sometimes can serve us well but can sometimes lead us astray. So the best example that we can always give, and you guys that have been with me for a while, probably heard me bang this drum for a while, but I'm just going to touch on it again. Um, let's say we have landing page A, and landing page A gets 1.2 page views per visit, which is a user experience metric. Um, the users are only viewing, one, on average, 1.2 page views per visit uh, when they land on page A. There's an 83% bounce rate, which is another user experience metric, and the effective CPM of this page which is the total CPM of the page is fifty dollars. So it's it's the, let's pretend it's the highest earning page on this website, right? So landing page B, however, uh, gets two point eight page views per visit. So more the users that land on this page are viewing more pages on average uh, whenever they land here. There's a thirty four percent bounce rate, and the effective CPM or total amount uh, that this page earns in the CPM rate. Um, is $25. And this, let's pretend that this is kind of the average eCPM uh, of this site. So the page itself is earning less money 
uh, than page A. However, when you take into account things like these user experience metrics, the number of page views per visit that each of these uh, average users is experiencing if they land on page A or page B, um, what you find is that the total amount that what this the site is earning from from the sessions that these users create is actually more on landing page B. And the reason is is because the users that are landing on page B are going on to visit other pages where they are seeing more ads, uh, have, having more ad impressions, and ultimately they're earning more money. And so this is a, one of the best examples that we have for why user experience and revenue are inexorably tied because a page itself may be earning more, but ultimately what you want to be optimizing for is the user session. So a user on one page does not make the total amount of revenue that you can earn from that user. It's their session that you should be optimizing for. And the only way to optimize for a user session is to look at revenue and user experience together. So we're going to dig into that a little bit more here. So this is why we use EPMV as a true north. So if you guys are Zoic users, you see that as a metric that we put in the dashboards. EPMV is actually really simple. It's your site earnings divided by a thousand visitors. It's really easy. So I just take the total amount of money that my site is earning divided by a thousand visitors and that's my EPMV. And it basically what that is allowing me to do is it's allowing me to count for things like page views per visit um, and, and the total amount of um, and revenue that I'm earning from user sessions. So that equation over on the right, it's actually really simple. Um, you're just taking the total amount uh, of money that you're generating in a CPM rate, dividing it by a thousand visitors and, and the sum of page views. Um, and basically what you're getting is the uh, EPMV and that is really a true north for publishers because you can actually make more uh, more in CPM but you can actually be making less money overall. Um, we've talked about this before a little bit. There's some really good blogs on our site about it um, but ultimately EPMV is a good way to know if, you're, if your EPMV is going up you're making more money. So what we've learned about user experience is that really these basic metrics um, that we that anybody can collect you probably have Google Analytics or another analytics system and these are really common ones these are still really some of the best ones to look at as it relates to measuring it with revenue so a good example of this is um, this is uh, some data that we've collected over time but it basically shows a correlation between uh, the time that someone spends on a page and earnings you can see it's pretty dramatic within that first about five to ten seconds um, the amount of money that you you can potentially lose if somebody bounces immediately from your site, which is really worth thinking about on mobile. If you ever have like, uh, you know, some kind of ad or something that's that's negative on your site that may be covering something, causing somebody to bounce immediately, there's just a lot of revenue that could be recovered if you if you make experiences to where people want to stay on the page and not bounce away immediately. Um, but ultimately, you see a linear progression between uh, session duration and earnings. The same thing can be said about page views per visit. So as you can see here, uh, the page view counts uh, are stay linear over a long period of time. So even up to 46 page views per visit, which there are sites on, I mean, we measure sites every day that, that, that see this type of thing. Um, what you're going to see is that um, there's a linear progression in earnings as more page views uh, accumulate. And uh, this is actually pretty, pretty impressive because you don't see a drop off anywhere. And so the more page views um, that you can get users to, to go through, the more money you can make. Um, but there are some caveats to that. It doesn't mean you turn your website into a gallery style website or anything like that. Um, there are certainly a number of caveats we're going to get to here in a minute on that. But I do want to point out one thing, and it is that those first few page views views are actually really critical. So it, it becomes a linear progression, but it's actually an exponential progression to start with. So you can see here on mobile, that third page view is absolutely critical. So if you can get users to go from one page view to three, the potential, the potential impact in terms of revenue is significant. So being able to take good care of your users um, has, has a major, major payoff, specifically on mobile here, but you can see the same thing occurs on desktop. So that is why this is so critical. The other thing is uh, more ads on a page does not equal more revenue. So this is just one site's worth of data. So don't take this as the gospel and go say, oh, I have to have only six ads on a page. But you can see this is actually really interesting because people are actually bouncing less uh, in this example with six ads than they are with one. Um, I won't go into the reasons why and, and some of that sort of thing. But every site is different as it relates to this information. And what's really interesting about this is you could, you could tailor your site so that 
basically everybody on your site is going to see six ads, let's say, right? But that might not be best for everybody. And some people may be bouncing at one or two and you would want to know that and make sure that they had a different experience so that they didn't leave and you can get that valuable third page view. On the other hand, you're leaving a lot of money on the table. Let's say if someone like Piper here maybe has a higher tolerance and she isn't going to, you can show her up to seven ads. And if you can measure this over time, what you can do is if you monitor users like her, you can grow more and more certain that ultimately what you want to do is show that person seven ads. And if you understand how someone is going to behave when they land on your site, you can ultimately deliver better ad experiences to them and optimize revenue and user experience at the same time. And that's a big idea behind what uh, Zoic does, right? So I'm not showing you this because this is something you need to go out and do. This is largely something that Zoic is already doing for you for if you're using the platform already. This is essentially why we created it. However, I wanted to share this with you because I think it's really important in understanding the overall strategy that we're discussing today. So before I move on any, for, uh, any, any further into kind of discussing some of the content tricks, I want to talk a little bit more about the impact of uh, UX on revenue. So this is kind of like a uh, roundabout way of kind of getting to this, but evergreen sites um, uh, that have basically been able to improve UX metrics through tailored ad experiences and layouts and things along those lines have seen pretty good improvements in SEO as well. So an evergreen site is a site that basically has a term like uh, you know, when is Easter or something like that, where it pretty much is ranked in the same position for a long period of time. There's not a lot changing as it relates to that. So what you see is pretty steady uh, keyword metrics, SEO metrics, traffic, organic traffic, that sort of thing. And what we found is that as you start to improve user experience metrics like bounce rate, time on site, page views per visit, there's also a correlation to pretty big bumps in uh, things like keyword rankings and stuff like that as well. So it's something to take into account because that does, I mean, traffic has an effect on revenue. So these are all things that Azoic is doing for you. Um, you guys are probably familiar with some of this, but it's you're going to see it's, it's kind of relevant to a lot of what I'm going to get to here in a minute. But uh, Azoic has taken all these things in account to, for you. All the things you can affect like ad type, ad location, ad size, the, the presence of other ads, which Piper is going to talk about here in a minute. Um, navigation options, page load speed, content locations, all these things you, you can affect and essentially use a Zoic to kind of like uh, manipulate for you. Um, and then there's all these other things that a Zoic will take into account for you, like device type, browser type, time of day, user connection. And these are all the things that basically we can optimize for the user on because once we, we know how certain users coming from Facebook behave on your site, we can start to deliver better experiences to them. So uh, one of the things uh, that I want to move beyond is, is move beyond just kind of talking about ads and, and, and use, tailoring user experiences beyond just ads and layouts. I want to give you guys some kind of actionable tips as it relates to your content as well. So this is something that I talk about quite a bit. I've done some speaking engagements on it, uh, long form versus short form content, uh, how to do both correctly. I think it's probably irrelevant to have me sit here and talk to you about uh, the benefits or drawbacks of both. Um, because they both have a place in the digital ecosystem. Um, what you'll find is that uh, publishers can leverage both successfully. Now, if you want to compare and contrast the two and make them battle it out in terms of which one's better for social media and which one's better for uh, organic search, those battles have really been won. And if you want, you can go Google the subject and there's tons of people that will give you their opinions on it. Um, but the truth is, you can monetize them both and you can monetize them both really well depending on your site niche uh, and the secret is really understanding how to get the most out of both forms. So I'm going to show you that a little bit already. So you can see over here on the, the, at the bottom here, these are just some facts about long and short form content. You can see long form content is generally shared more, uh, generally ranks higher in search position. But again, this is not necessarily to say that one is better than the other, um, because the truth is, is you can monetize them both. And ultimately, you know, you could have a long form article that ranks number one in Google for something, but a short form article that ranks lower, but ultimately generates more revenue because the user experience is better. So making short form content work, uh, understanding which articles uh, maybe you need to recommend next, um, how different content links together, um, and leveraging content analytics. So uh, Piper is going to get into a little bit of this uh, later on today. She's going to show you how to pull reports inside of Zoic that basically 
uh, allow you to look at things in terms of landing pages and how users navigate your site and how to kind of maybe link some things together. Um, also be able to look at revenue on an EPMV basis that way like we did in the beginning. Um, you can also offer in-touch factors like newsletters, pop-ups on desktop. You don't, I don't want you to get hit by a mobile interstitial penalty, penalty so maybe keep those, those pop-ups off of mobile. But um, on desktop, you can certainly still use them. And then things like social share buttons to basically keep your audience engaged. So even if they do leave the site after one or two page views, you have a mechanism for getting back in touch with them or maybe encouraging them to visit another page. Um, gallery or other interactive elements. So uh, you don't want to make every page on your site a gallery style site, I would say. But I do think that if you have short form content that links together really seamlessly, um, like maybe how to stuff, uh, that, that, that goes together really well, you can start to look at maybe some gallery style elements to your site that you could implement to, to encourage users to, um, to go from one page to the next. Same thing to say for box video. Sometimes having videos embedded on the page can make people kind of like, uh, some people like video, some people don't. You can add uh, light box videos where people just click and then the video comes up from there and it'll make the page load faster and ultimately keep you from having to worry about things like page load speed whenever you're implementing things like video to increase time on site. And then the last one is supplement the content with embedded outsider content from social media, YouTube, or SlideShare. So one of the things you can do is if you have already short content and you're like, hey, listen, this is just what it is. I'm get, I already provided the max amount of information on the subject as possible. Things you can do is you can take posts that maybe somebody has shared on social media and embed them in there. Or same thing with YouTube or slide shares, um, because those things are not content that you've created, but you can embed them on your site and leverage those things to keep people maybe on the page a little bit longer. If you think back to our linear progression between time on site and uh, overall revenue. A lot of these same things are true for long form content, um, but for you guys that haven't re read, read our blog before, I've written a lot about this subject, way more in depth than what I can get into today, and actually done previous webinars that you can go to our YouTube channel and view about this subject, but basically you want to adopt proven structures that basically draw eyes down the page and improve time on site and decrease bounce rate. So you want to basically have things like images, videos, quotes, and other unique items to break up the scroll every few lines. So you want to just have an image, some text, a quote, break up your paragraphs into, in, into a lot of different uh, sections so that you don't have these big blocks of text. They have a tendency to scare people away. Um, when we start talking about long form, sometimes people think long form content is six or 800 words. But as you start to look at some of the research on the subject, True long form content tends to be about 1200 words or more. Those tend to do the best. So if you're gonna invest the time to do something long form, it really is worth investing in things like, uh, you know, being able to expand on a subject further if you can, uh, or again, embedding things like social media or videos into it to, um, to add to the uh, overall content. And then also you wanna use links to other articles throughout. So like con consistently linking to your other articles that are relevant inside the text. Mm -hmm. um, but don't be scared to put them at the top. I see this a lot. People get scared to put links to other content at the top because they think, oh, I'm gonna force person off this page onto another page. Well, that's a good thing as we saw earlier today. And one of the things I've always pushed to people is put the ability to make decisions in their hands sometimes. So if I wanna link to another article on my site that I think they're gonna like, and I make sense to link to it at the top. Let me link it at the top. If they want, they'll come back to it. They'll click it. Maybe they'll read this. They'll come back. They'll read that page. Ultimately, what I want them to do is navigate my site however they see fit. Um, I don't want to have in my mind maybe a set structure of how they have to navigate it because ultimately what I can do then is my ideas might not mesh up really well uh, with how they want to navigate my site. Think back to my Montgomery City example in the beginning is I may have an idea for a great restaurant, but the people may not see my idea the same. So um, with that being said, I want to move a little bit now away from how we can manipulate our content and things like that to basically how we can leverage a uh, Zoic in this process, uh, which does have some content ramifications as well. So Piper, I will let you hop in here. Let me go full screen so people can, um, uh, people can easily get in here and see the details of what you're doing. There we go. So you can start where, to go? wherever you like. Awesome. Hey guys. So I just want to touch on how uh, how you can optimize your Ezoic settings um, and use Ezoic to your full potential to balance user experience and revenue. 
Um, so these are things we've talked about before, but they're really important. Uh, so we'd like to touch on them again. So uh, the most important thing is wrapping your ads. We've always talked about this. This is part of the setup process and it allows our system to identify where your existing ads are on the site. Um, if you wanna balance user experience and revenue, our system helps you do that, um, but it needs to be set up properly in order to efficiently do so. So here's an example of um, a question we get a lot. Um, let's say this is a website that wants to use Ezoic, and they say that this ad right here in the top of the sidebar on the right is their best performing ad unit. So they wanna leave that one unwrapped on the page, um, but they'll wrap all the other ads on the page for Ezoic to optimize. There's a couple different problems with this. Um, let's say you leave this ad unwrapped and a user lands on the site and they click this ad unit. Um, Ezoic system cannot tell if, if the site generated revenue because it looks like a bounce to our system. Um, so it will try rearranging all the other ads on the page to get that user to stay on the page um, because it doesn't realize that they actually did click on this ad. So it's gonna hurt the optimization of the entire site. Um, so we recommend wrapping that ad. Another thing uh, that can happen is um, this ad unit might perform really well for you know, the majority of your users. Let's say 60% of your users, this ad unit is part of a, a winning ad combination. But for the rest of your users, um, you know, a particular group of people, maybe someone on their desktop in New York in the evening, this ad actually doesn't uh, generate much revenue. So there's another ad combination that performs a lot better. In that case, uh, we don't want to show this ad there. Uh, so wrapping all your ads will allow the system to find the optimal combination of ads for each user. Remember, there's no one size fits all. This is about customizing the ad experience to every single user to the site so that they visit more pages, they spend more time on the site, they absorb more content, engage with the, with the content, and you also generate more revenue. So Piper, just real quick, this is just for people that are using uh, our ad tester application inside yes. the platform, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is for the ad tester. So uh, make sure you guys wrap all your ads. That's that's definitely the first step and um, the number one way to ensure that you're gonna get the best results from Ezoic. Um, and and if, they're, if they're struggling with this or they're not fully sure uh, if they have all their ads wrapped mm -hmm. or if, uh, if they need help wrapping all their ads, what should they do? Um, they can email support at ezoic.com if they need help. Um, there's also a ton of resources on our knowledge base. I think there's a video walkthrough tutorial um, and also a support article on wrapping your existing ads. Once, you, once you've wrapped one or two of them, you'll get the hang of it. It's really simple. Um, so now I want to I wanna go into our advanced reporting. So... Um, Hopefully most of you have been uh, in this section of the site. It's under reporting and then advanced reporting. And I just ran a report for landing pages. Um, you can change the date range. You can filter this uh, however you like. Um, but since Tyler talked about landing page optimization, we figured we'd pull this report up and then you can go ahead and um, rank these by the top landing pages. So uh, this is a really useful tool because you can come in and um, you can see how each page differs in terms of its user experience metrics. So you have page views per visit, bounce rate, um, and then also the EPMV. And as you can see, different types of content um, and different keywords uh, perform very differently from each other. So the way that we recommend using this is coming in and looking at your top landing pages and look at the user experience metrics and see what is um, what what your what your users are engaging with. So the ones that have the low bounce rates, the one that have a lot of page views per visit, those are articles that your users are are engaging with. Um, and let's say it's a, a gallery type 
um, article. Maybe that's something that works well for a certain type of content. Uh, maybe try some more of that. Maybe it's a certain keyword that your users are really interested in. You can now generate more content around that. So this is a really useful tool um, for all publishers to use. And like I said, you can filter it whichever way you want, by devices, by traffic source. If you want to see um, your Facebook users on mobile, um, how those articles are performing, you can break it down like that as well. Which is, it's really interesting. So you could look at Facebook articles. So like if you are posting things to Facebook or uh, potentially you know, going after certain keywords, you can actually, you know, we were talking about earlier looking at landing page EPMB. You can see that right over here on the right. Um, you know, it, it'd be really good as you create new content or think about how you share things on social media mm -hmm. to maybe understand, you know, there's some articles here that I see that are, you know, $6 EPMBs versus $23 EPMBs. Um, you know, if, I, if, if it's me, I'm trying to invest as much as possible in new content that's like that $23 EPMB mm -hmm. content, right? Mm -hmm. And like you said, sharing that $23 EPMB content. So if you see that this, uh, this article is doing really well, that's one you could post on your Facebook, on your Twitter, LinkedIn, what have you. Um, so then the, the third and final thing I wanted to point out was um, the optimization settings. So uh, if you go into the settings tab on your Ezoic dashboard, and then you'll see optimization goals right here. This allows you to choose uh, or to weight the different uh, variables you want the system to optimize for. So balanced is our default. Um, I always recommend that publishers start with that setting. Uh, it balances UX and revenue equally. Um, but you can also change this to be revenue focused, user experience focused, or you can customize it. So if you come in here, um, these are the, the, the different weightings for the revenue focused. Um, but let's say page views per visit is really important for you or bounce rate is, is really important for you. Um, you can move, the, you can toggle these uh, to suit your goals. Um, I, I do want to point out right here, it's not optimal to uh, optimize for bounce rate, uh, just because a lot of sites have a natural bounce rate. So for instance, if you're a reference website and um, you know, like a dictionary website and someone's just looking up the definition of a word, they're probably not going to spend a ton of time on the site or view a bunch of pages. They're just there to get that information and leave. Um, so optimizing for the bounce rate in that case um, isn't recommended. Um, but we give you um, some, some uh, pre-set up ones right here that you can use. Um, and if there is a, a variable that's or a metric that's really important to you, you can um, optimize for that here. So that's pretty much all I had. That's pretty cool. And I, you know, I want to point out, you know, we, the settings here also, you know, it, we have a setting for revenue, right? But then, you know, we, we should, you saw the graphs earlier on page views per visit and time on site and their effect on revenue as well. So you mm -hmm. may be working on projects right now where you're, you're leveraging these reports to try to improve things like page views per visit so you can increase your EPMVs. So you may, that may be why you would want to maybe alter these or customize these on your own. But if you're like, hey, I just want to optimize for both as efficiently as possible, you can always, our default setting mm -hmm. is kind of built for that, right? Mm -hmm. I would always start with the balanced default setting, at least for the first four to six weeks. And then from there, um, definitely chat with your account manager if you're thinking about testing another one. Just remember that if you do change these settings, just like with any testing variables. When you change something, it's going to take some time for things to, to change. So if you change it to revenue focus, you need to leave it for another three to four weeks to see the results. You can't switch it day to day. You're not going to get those results. That makes total sense. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So here's what we're going to do now, guys. I want to remind you of a couple things that we have right now, which is you can go on our YouTube channel right now and you can view uh, all of our previous webinars. Um, anybody that wasn't that signed up for the web event, so if you have colleagues that signed up for this event and they weren't able to attend, they'll get a recorded version of it. Um, but at, at the end, at the conclusion of this, it just takes a little time for the videos to render. All of you will get a free copy of this uh, in your emails again as soon as it has a chance to upload to the database. Um, so you guys can review this and uh, go back through it if there's something that you wanted to. 
uh, kind of like remember and, and work on. Um, but we've done a lot of previous ones. Um, me in particular, I've, I've done a lot of stuff on things uh, as it relates to basically site marketing, organic search, social media, a lot of different things. And so I encourage you to go on there and check those videos out. Um, and then also our blog. Uh, I write I write twice a week into that blog and there are, I would say the stuff that's in there can probably help 99% of websites that are on the internet today. And so I really encourage you to go on, read those articles. Um, that being said, uh, I want to make sure that we have a chance to answer any questions that you might have about um, basically balancing UX and revenue, questions about things that I've talked about today or things that Piper has shown you. So I'm going to go back into camera mode here and take a look at some of the questions that we might have. Um, just give me one second here, guys. So, uh, does Azoic support placing ads and sideboards with three mm -hmm. column layout? Mm -hmm. Piper. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, we do. So, uh, when you're setting up the uh, placeholders, that's what we call the potential ad locations. When you're setting those up, you get to choose the position type. And we offer a bunch of preset position types, and there are a um, there's a sidebar top, sidebar middle, and sidebar bottom. It's really important that you classify them correctly, but you can use um, multiple placeholders of the same position type on the page. So what I would recommend is, if you have um, a left sidebar and a right sidebar, I would do sidebar top for both of those, or sidebar middle or sidebar bottom. And, yeah, you can you can crunch in here. We're sh we're sharing a webcam right now. So, uh, what can publishers do to combat ad blockers? That's a good question. That is a good question. So, um, we actually have a, a new feature that's under um, uh, in the App Store, and it is an ad blocker uh, control. So, what this does is if a user is using an ad blocker. We won't show the normal ads, but we do have some ad providers that will show um, for those users. So you're still generating some revenue from them. Um, I'd say the other thing to do, uh, yeah, so it's right here. So it's automatically on for everyone. If you want to turn it off, then you can install the app. Um, so we're automatically showing those ads for users that are um, using ad blockers. Um, the other thing I'd recommend is uh, just make sure that you're you're providing high quality content, original content, um, and you're writing for the users, not just to to generate revenue. I think that's initially why the whole ad blocking movement started was people were just putting content out there, loading the page up with ads, and and totally forgetting about user experience. So make sure you're providing that high quality content. Ezoic should be balancing the user experience for you, so um, that should take care of it. Yeah, and I'll add a couple things. So yeah, we do have the app uh, as a part of our system now. So if you're leveraging Ezoic, we're, there are some things that our system is doing to circumvent uh, ad blocking already for you. The other thing is, um, and this may be news to you, it's news to probably a lot of people, but Google announced yesterday that some versions of the newest Chrome browser that they'll release later this year may have some ad blocking features oh, in it. That, yeah. But if you read about it, uh, it, they talk a lot about the IAB and the, uh, the Coalition for Better Ads, which we are involved with. And if you look at the types of ads that they say that they will block, they are largely the things that are the worst things on the internet. They are autoplay video ads. They are the um, the preload uh, countdown ads and things like that. The things that are just Top really, re yeah, re yeah, really negative pop-ups. Things that aren't going to appear on your site if you're leveraging Azoic fully, um, but also probably shouldn't be on your site anyways. If you're leveraging those types of ads, the part of your monetization strategy, I would encourage you to get rid of them because they're really bad for user experience. And I mean, we know this, and ultimately there are probably better ways for you to monetize your site. Uh, with ads, if you want to be really ad heavy, um, they're still not even the most effective form of ads. Mm -hmm. so. To add to that, if if you guys are you know vetting a new <clears throat> excuse me, if you're vetting a new ad partner or you want to try out a new ad type, I highly recommend not just monitoring the revenue that you generate from it, but also the user experience metrics. Um, I have a lot of publishers who will you know add a a, a new pop up video or a video 
product-based ad or something like that. Um, and yes, it's a, an additional stream of revenue, but you need to look at your overall EPMV and how that's been affected because all ads on the page dilute each other. And also look at your bounce rate. If your bounce rate all of a sudden shoots up because you've added this, this new ad type to the page, um, that's really gonna hurt you in the long run and it's not worth any additional revenue right now. That's absolutely right. And I think that's it, Piper. So uh, we won't take any more of your valuable time today. Thank you guys for tuning in to the event. And we'll certainly have more of these uh, to come. Uh, I think next month we have uh, another Q&A like we did last month. And so that was really successful. And we we're hopeful to do one of those again. Please continue to check out our um, blog, all the other webinars on YouTube. Hopefully you guys are enjoying the content. And uh, thank you, uh, our good friend Dave Taylor, yeah. uh, for joining us in the chat today. Dave is also a writer on our blog, offering some great tips. He's a 20-year veteran of the digital publishing world, probably longer than that if you were to ask him. And so uh, Dave is a writer for the blog as well, so he shares his uh, thoughts and ideas as well. So thank you guys very much, and have a great day.